Space research can be viewed as the nearest modern equivalent yet devised to the pyramid building and similar ritualistic enterprises of ancient societies. It is true that the scientific value of the space program, even of what has already been accomplished, is substantial on its own terms, but current programs are absurdly and obviously disproportionate to the relationship of the knowledge sought to the expenditure committed. All but a small fraction of the space budget measured by the standards of comparable scientific objectives must be charged de facto to the military economy. Future space research projected as a war surrogate, in other words, replacement for war, would further reduce the scientific rationale of its budget to a minuscule percentage indeed. Here you'll see credibility, in fact, lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute for war. This is where the space race proposals, in many ways so well suited to economic substitutes for war, fall short. The most ambitious and unrealistic space project cannot of itself generate a believable external menace. It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last best hope of peace, etc., by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-our-world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents of recent years were in fact early experiments of this kind. I'm telling you right now, that's exactly what they are, were, and are going to be in the near future. Where was Roswell at? 509th Bomber Wing. What was the 509th Bomb Wing? The people in the Air Force who had the highest security clearances in the nation had dropped the bomb on Japan felt tremendously guilty about all of the people that they had killed and so we're ripe for somebody to come along and say let's fake a flying saucer crash we'll get some monkeys and shave their hair off chop off their ears and their nose do a little surgical invention intervention intervention sprinkle their bodies on the desert and let some people take a quick glimpse and then we'll say the whole thing never happened And at that exact same time, what was the government trying to do? They had created the United Nations in 1945. The headlines of all the papers across the country were blaring about the United Nations becoming a world government, debating whether it should have its own armed forces and police force. And the American people weren't going to buy it. They needed an external threat. So they invented one. And it wasn't hard to produce UFOs from outer space from the super secret technology that they were developing out in the deserts of the West. All they had to do was take off and fly around so people could see it. The face on Mars. There it is, folks. And just to the left of the face on Mars over here, you see a whole bunch of pyramids. Now, if we know NASA's faking photographs, why in the world should we believe what they tell us is on Mars? You show me one fake photograph and tell me it's your family and I find out it's some woman living in Hoboken, New Jersey and never heard of you before. What makes you think I'm going to believe it when you show me a picture of your grandma and grandpa? There it is, the face on Mars. Now, look up here. You ever see a square crater? <laughs> Must have been made by a square meteorite. <laughs> look at this arrow. It's all the black dots. The black dots, they, NASA tells us, is where the transmission of the picture fell out and being transmitted from Mars back to the Earth. They're dots that weren't filled in by the transmission.
NASA tells us that the atmosphere on Mars exists, but it's only 2% of the Earth's atmosphere. Then why does NASA have on its books plans for a Mars plane? If the atmosphere around Mars is only 2% of the atmosphere around Earth, no plane, I don't care how they built it, could fly in such an atmosphere. Yet this is an official NASA photograph of the Mars plane that they have planned to send to Mars to fly around in its atmosphere and take pictures and all of that kind of stuff. Again, there's a face on Mars to the left of the pyramids. This is all that stuff that What's-His-Name is talking about. What is his name? I've forgotten. Richard Hoagland, that's right. Now, if all of these pictures are real, then all of his theories could be valid. But if these are fake pictures, then everything he says is based upon a lie. Is he a part of it? I don't know. Don't even care. Mars photographs which appear to have the remains of agricultural terracing. This is supposed to make us believe that at one time on Mars there was a tremendously successful civilization that had developed to the stage where they perfected agricultural terracing in order to feed the populations of their civilization. For years, when I made up this, these slides, NASA had been denying that there was anything called an aurora. So had the Air Force and everyone else. We now know that it exists. They've admitted it. So this is a moot point here. Now, let me give you some food for thought here. If you think I'm full of baloney, and if you think these people haven't been around for a long time, this 1917, upon a visit by the Imperial Japanese delegation headed by Viscount Ishii, John Dewey, the author of our extremely destructive educational system, destructive to the minds of our young people, said this in a speech at the dinner for Viscount Ishii and the Imperial Japanese mission. Quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. 1917, John Dewey was a member of the Illuminati. There it is, blown up so you can read it for yourself. Years later, during the Reagan administration, Reagan said on at least eight different occasions the exact same thing that John Dewey said in 1917. And you heard one of them on that tape. This is one here. Remarks of the president to Falston High School students and faculty. Falston High School, Falston, Maryland, December 4th, 1985. This is what he said. I couldn't, but one point in our discussion privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but to say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. <coughs> is this what's going on? Does anybody know who that is? That's the creature from the Black Lagoon. Remember that movie? That's him. <coughs> He doesn't look so fierce. I think he looks kind of neat myself, friendly, cuddly, cute little feller. He's just looking for love. <laughs> this is the, up in the upper left is the city of Tonopah, Nevada. 
to the right and down are portions of the desert where some of this testing takes place. And at the lower right corner, you'll see part of the Nellis test range. Here you see a huge expanse of the Nevada desert where they test these things. And just see that writing that slants up like this toward the top right? It says Saucer Mesa. We were going over the geodetic, coast and geodetic survey maps of the area. We found Saucer Mesa. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm just pointing that out. And we don't know what it means. It could be innocent. There might be a mesa there that looks like a saucer. But in light of what they're testing out there, it's logical that it's named for something else. This is a letter sent to me by someone who worked out there, who saw crates labeled Project Red Light, and who saw the craft fly. Another one, same stuff. If you read it, they're telling me. And you see, I go by things that they say in their letter and dates that they give me that I can cross-check from other sources and determine whether or not they're telling me the truth. These people are telling the truth. They really did work out there. They really did see these things fly. They really knew what they were talking about. It was ultimately based upon these letters. A couple of years later, I went out there, snuck into the test, fight, the test site, and actually took photographs of, of these things hovering in daylight above the flight line. This is the Nevada test site, and you can see Where is it now? I believe it's right there. That's Groom Dry Lake right there. Down here is Papoose Lake. You can read all you want from Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is full of crap. He never worked in Area 51. He never worked in Papoose Lake. He never was a physicist at Alamogordo at all. Bob Lazar was in the phone book at Alamogordo under the physics department, his name is listed, but he was not a physicist. He has a contract with Alamogordo. Or not Alamogordo, but the, uh, trying to think of the name of the laboratory. Los Alamos. He has a contract with Los Alamos National Laboratory with the physics department to develop the film from the dosimeter badges to tell whether anybody has been exposed to radiation. That's why his name was in that phone book. Bob Lazar is a liar, one of the biggest liars that's ever walked upon the face of this earth. He has never ever worked in Area 51 or Papoose Lake. He never saw flying saucers, never worked on back engineering or anything else. This is, uh, what, what is, oh yeah, this is uh, Highway 93. Take a little jog here, go over Hancock Summit, down to, this is Highway 375. Zip across here. This is the Tickaboo Valley. This is Groom Dry Lake. Everything takes place over here, over this valley, and up in this area up here, if you go out there. That's Groom Dry Lake. There are underground tunnels which go to other government and military installations. We have marked two of those tunnels on this map. You're not going to see the tunnels, they're underground. This is a satellite photograph of Area 51. We went to the United States government, asked them if there was anything there, and if there was, what was it? They said there's nothing there, period. It's just a dry lake bed and desert. The United States Air Force said the same thing. There's nothing out there, dry lake bed and desert. There is no such thing as Area 51, period. So we went to the Russians and got satellite photographs. Now what does that tell you? Who are they hiding it from? If they tell me it doesn't exist, and they know damn well the Russians have photographs of it, who are they hiding it from? From me, not the Russians. They know about it. That's who we got these photographs from.
this is the Groom Dry Lake Area 51 facility taken by Russian satellite. That is a landing strip. It's one of the longest landing strips in the world. It's over 35,000 feet long. Uh, I used to know, I don't remember. Again, satellite photograph. Now at the time that this photograph was taken, afterwards, after these photographs had been taken, they have extended the runway even farther than what it is there. I can't hear you. Groom Dry Lake, they started construction uh, to our knowledge in 1954. <coughs> right about the time that they begin to perfect this anti-gravity and electromagnetic drive stuff and begin to classify it and make sure that nobody ever wrote about it again. They also developed the U-2 here and the SR-71 and a lot of other secret aircraft were developed and test flown from Groom Dry Lake. They have one of every kind of MiG that the Russians have ever developed at Area 51. It's another photograph from satellite. No. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. <laughs> this is another Soviet satellite photograph of the Groom Dry Lake facility. Pardon? Yeah, they're gigantic tunnels. Yeah, they have huge tunnel boring machines that the American public is generally not aware of, yeah. These are some of the facilities and they're what they actually are that we've been able to identify. No, it's level. Text or remarks by the President to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations, New York, New York, September 21st, 1987. In our obsession with an antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside, listen to what he says, perhaps, and he's talking to the United Nations, remember this. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Is this what's happening? You start reading New Age publications and they tell you that the benevolent space brothers are here to help us. And, uh, you know, if everything falls apart, they're going to pick up the best people in the world, the good New Age people, and take them aboard their flying saucers and whisk them away to their planet. Are you kidding me? Somebody from another planet came here and took one look at what we're doing on this Earth. You think they'd take us back to their planet? Huh? Not a chance. Is this what it is? Or is this what's happening? <laughs> Are those aliens a decoy for something much more terrible? You better bet your life they are. I don't know. I found this in a magazine and decided to take a picture of it. I thought it was great. I don't even remember what magazine it was. It was a long, long time ago. And that's the end of that trick. We just got a few more slides to go here. Okay, lights again. 
Here's one of the best photographs of a UFO flying saucer type craft that I've ever seen. The guy who took this was on vacation in Hawaii. Do you think he was looking at the UFO? No, he was looking at those beautiful hula dancers and that's all he cared about. He didn't even know that he'd taken a picture of a UFO until months later when he was going through his pictures and just happened to look away from the girls and see it. He never knew it was there. This is what it is. That is a genuine photograph of a real UFO. It is not a fake. And the guy didn't even know he had it. Yeah, his wife was there too. She really was there. Pardon? I don't know if they showed it on the news or not. Now, here's something extremely interesting. Don't they tell us that Venus, the planet Venus, is covered with huge, miles thick, dense clouds of chemicals and acid and all kinds of vapors and, and that the surface of Venus is extremely hot. No life could live on it. Don't they tell us that? Well, this is a radar, a cloud penetrating radar map of Venus. That's what they tell us. They sent an orbiter up there that had cloud penetrating radar and they tell us this is what the surface of Venus looks like. And look how they try to perpetuate the hole at the pole theory with that silly little dimple up there. My father's flown across the poles, folks. He's a pilot. He's brought back pictures of the North Pole and the South Pole from his flights. He was at one time with the United States Air Force Weather Service, and that was his job, was to fly into the places of the world with the worst weather and make scientific uh, recordings of temperature and wind and all that kind of stuff. There are no holes at the poles, I can assure you. So all that hollow earth stuff is bunch of bunk. Yeah, that's what it says. But that's not what the lunatic fringe picks up. What they pick up is that there's a hole in the pole of Venus and they're trying to hide it by saying that they couldn't scan it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's what they say. I've heard them. I get letters from them. Bill, this is proof that there's a hole at the pole in Venus. So the hollow earth theory is correct. I write back and say, no. The orbiter couldn't cover that area of the planet. And it's just a place where they didn't map. No, no, they're just saying that because they don't want us to know there's a hole at the pole. <laughs> No. Huh? Now look at this. If they're correct about Venus being covered with thick, dense clouds of chemicals and gases and vapors so that they couldn't photograph the surface from space, they had to radar map it, how did the Russian Venera space probe land on the surface of Venus and take this picture of its own leg sitting on the surface of Venus? Can anybody explain that to me? I can't explain it either. Neither can NASA and neither can the Russians. Here's another two views. The surface and portions of the lander taken by the lander on the surface and the radar mapped image of the supposed surface of Venus. This is Neil Armstrong stepping down upon the lunar surface for the first time. Anybody tell me who took that picture? Anybody here? Tell me who took this picture. <laughs> Official NASA photograph. Nobody was on the moon. Who took this picture? Official NASA photographer. <laughs> well, you are right. It's an official NASA photographer who took this picture in a studio somewhere in the Mercury test site of Nevada where they made all of the damn pictures. 
<laughs> Check this out, folks. This is really hilarious. <laughs> folks, all of the light on the moon comes from one source, doesn't it? The sun, right? How come the whole surface of the moon isn't equally illuminated? This is a studio photograph made with spots. Look at the shadow where the guy's taking the picture. Now look again, look here. Look directly in the center of his faceplate, you'll see the other astronaut. There was only two of them. The other astronaut supposedly took the picture. If you blow that up, you'll see he has no camera. No camera whatsoever. You can also see the shadow in the faceplate going toward the astronaut who supposedly took the picture, who's directly in front of him, and you can see his shadow on the moon going somewhere else, which means the picture in the faceplate is artificially inserted. This is as fake as it comes, folks. And you don't have to have a photography degree to see it. I'll tell you something else about the moon. In space, the sun and the stars are so bright, ladies and gentlemen. Illumination is even over everything. There are no dark and light, except in shadow. When they did this, they had no latitude in the best film that we could produce. Exposure had to be perfect. So if those cameras exposed to see detail where the light is hitting, you would see absolutely nothing in the shadow because the film had no latitude. If you're exposed to get some detail in the shadow, all of the places where the light hit would be totally washed out. You wouldn't see anything. It would be overexposed. This is a studio shot made by a professional photographer who set up the lights so that he could get an even exposure and detail in the light and the shadow. Yes? You gotta talk real loud. Yeah. And something about you could see a building in the background. <laughs> it's all fake. The Apollo moon landings were faked. All of the film, video, and pictures that they have shown the public are fake. They're phony. And it's easy to find out. Look at the shadows. Look at the difference between the light and the dark areas. Could not possibly capture that on film. Not only that, folks, but look at the shadow that he's casting on the surface of the moon. How come you can't see anything there? Because somebody is standing over here with a fill card. If you're a photographer, you know what that is. It's just a white sheet of cardboard that reflects some of the light back into the shadows of the astronaut, but they're not bothering to reflect any down onto the shadow that he's casting from the spotlight behind him onto the artificial ground that they've got there. I have no idea, but they didn't accomplish it the way they said they did if they've accomplished anything, or with the vehicles or the spacesuits that they say they've accomplished them with. Have you seen orbit our planet? Yeah, we can orbit our planet. But with the vehicles that they say have gone to the moon, they couldn't even get through the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt is so radioactive that those craft that they say they went to the moon in do not have enough protection to shield them from that radiation. Period. Besides the temperature up there is hot. You better believe it. You can send unmanned vehicles anywhere you want, yeah. The problem is getting a man out there. The problem is just getting a man through the Van Allen belt that surrounds the Earth without making crispy critters out of them from the radiation. Aviation Week and Space Technology. This was uh, November 21st, 19 what, 88? 
This is the text page of an ad that appeared in there. An Amoco ad about oil. There's nothing in this ad that would suggest that the facing page, a part of this ad, would be this cute little fellow. We called Amoco and we asked them, where'd this come from? It's a neat ad, we really like it. We wanna compliment you. Where did you get the model? Oh, it's a 12 inch high statue that we had an artist make, but it's not. This is not a photograph of a 12 inch high statue, even though they say it is. And I'm gonna show you why. If anybody that wants to can get up there as close as you can, you can see hair. You ever seen the hair on a baby's butt? Real fine, silky hair, almost microscopic. Go up there and look. It's on his neck. It's on the neck of this thing, the same hair. You see it? Yeah, it's there. This is not a 12 inch high model of anything. Whatever this is, is much more complicated than any model. You see it? Barely, but it's, it's there, there, right? There. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be smooth. Anybody back here want to come up and look before I switch the slide? If you do, come and look now. Get up close, Seth. Right on the neck, where it's sunny, where it's lit up. You see it? Is it there? See, folks, I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Let me ask you again, was it there? It was there. You heard it, right from the horse's mouth. Look at this, look at the detail on the head. Look at the moisture in the eye. Look at the folds of the eye. No, I'm not going backwards, I'm only going one way. You wanna see it real quick? Jump up there, get up there, hurry. Hurry up, go. Anybody else? Real quick. You see the hair on the neck? You think an artist could produce hair like that on a 12 inch high model? No, they lied to us. Could they produce hair like that on a 12 foot model? Maybe. Maybe. But you're going to see there's not much phony about this. Look at the moisture in the eye. Look at the little folds around the eye. Look at the detail in the skin, the lips. Look at the creases on the neck. Well, why would they put that in the magazine and tell you that it was a photograph I don't know. of a model? That's the question. Why would they do it? It has nothing to do with Amoco or oil. Why is it even in the ad? It has nothing to do with the text on the page that I showed you. If you read it, it had absolutely nothing to do with it. They just put it in there. Look at the moisture and the mucus inside the nose. Look at the lines and the bags under the eyes. Now if I had to make a bet, folks, I would bet that this is something they created in a laboratory and it's alive. If I had to make a bet. I don't think in 1988 they could make anything this realistic that wasn't. I just don't believe it. I've never seen a monster in any movie that looked real to me. This looks real to me. They can do some fantastic things in movies, can't they? But I've never seen one, ever, that looked real like this looks. Now I'm not telling you that this is alive or this is real. I am telling you that they have genetic laboratories across this country where they are experimenting on cloning and on creating life different from life as we know it. And where they have been experimenting on the human genome to identify all the genes 
I also know that all over this country there have been mysterious cattle mutilations where portions of cattle have been taken in the middle of the night, mysteriously, and some of the things that have been taken have been cow's eyes. Does that look like a human eye? No. Does it look like a cow's eye? Sure looks like a cow's eye to me. Is it? I don't know. And I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying this is really weird. <clears throat> Who's this character? Jacques Vallée. How many of you have heard of Jacques Vallée? One of the great wizards of ufology. I call it ufology. He's identifying himself here as a member of the Illuminati. As his portrait was taken, he put his eye in the triangle. He's saying, I am one of the elect few. I am Illuminati. Oh, this is Dr. Uh, Kurzweil, Stephen Kurzweil. He called me up one time and said, Bill, you're never going to believe this. I said, well, first place, tell me who, who, who are you? I don't even know who you are. He said, I'm a dentist, or excuse me, a doctor in New York City. And I was recruited by Bud Hopkins, who's one of the so-called well-known abductee researchers who writes books about this stuff to be a member of a research team to record the progression of mind control experiments on people to make them think they've been abducted by aliens. And the guy that recruited me is Bud Hopkins, who's identified himself to me and shown me his identification as being an agent of the Central Intelligence Agency. And I said, well, did, you know, are you gonna do it? He said, well, I already did it. And when I saw how these people were being treated and then just dumped out in the street, not knowing what happened to them and having their minds all screwed up by these people, I objected and now they're trying to take my medical license away. So he sent me all the paperwork for the Medical Board of New York City and all this kind of stuff and the testimony and everything. And uh, I investigated it and I sent a whole stack of research that I had to the medical board and sent them a copy of my book and we managed to save this man's license and prove that Bud Hopkins is a member of the Central Intelligence Agency. And there's Stephen Kurzweil's affidavit and this is all on record in the state of New York for anybody who wants to investigate it. Read that. <laughs> it's incredible. And it just verifies what I wrote in my book that everybody at the top of the pyramid in the ufology movement are all Central Intelligence Agency operatives, including Stanton T. Friedman, Bruce McAbee, who has already admitted after I named him as a CIA agent, and everybody said, Bill Cooper's full of crap, he's calling everybody CIA. Bruce McAbee then admitted that on a regular basis, he gave briefings to the higher echelon of the Central Intelligence Agency on what's happening in the UFO movement. John Lear has admitted that he has been a member of the Central Intelligence Agency for most of his life, flew drugs for Air America in and out of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia, and still works for a CIA proprietary airlines based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And on and on and on and on and on. I could go on and on and on. It's incredible. Ah, this is, uh, what's this? Oh, this is verification of something I wrote in my book. This guy sent me a letter. And he verified that when he was in the Air Force, he also saw the message from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which ordered all members of the Armed Forces not to take any further orders from the White House. That was during the Nixon coup. Only it wasn't Nixon taking over the Joint Chiefs of Staff took over, cut off all communications to the White House, 
ordered all military units not to accept any orders from the White House, and then they just went in and told Nixon to resign. Nixon had no choice. He couldn't even call up anybody to help him, because who controls the communications for the White House? The military. I was the first one who told the world that that had happened. There's another guy who came out and told his story. It's in my book. That was Randall Terpstra. And then I got the letter from uh, Mr. Uh, David Jones here, and is signed by two witnesses down on the bottom that he saw the same thing. And since then, there's been others who've come forth. But Nixon didn't resign. That was a military coup. Yeah, Ford's a 33rd degree Freemason. You all know that, right? If you didn't, you do now. Not that we, we can't find any proof that Nixon was a Freemason. We can find proof that he was CFR and all this other stuff. I threw this in here because I keep hearing this stuff that I'm just one lonely, helpless human being. There's nothing I can do. I don't have any money, I gotta support my family. And then I have other people who come up and say, Bill, do you have any heroes? There's my hero. It's my hero. My hero, I love that man. He is an example of what a hero really is. That's Tiananmen Square. One lonely, solitary, helpless, broke, enslaved individual had the guts to stop 17 of the biggest, most terrifying, most dangerous killing machines that have ever been built in the history of the world by himself. Can you imagine how lonely and how scared he is standing there? He's my hero. He's not even an American. He's a Chinese boy. Pardon? Who knows? But they didn't. Maybe they were as impressed by him as I am. Of course. You think they would let him get away with that? They threw him in prison. Why did they stop and not run over him and squish him? They were probably embarrassed and just as impressed by his bravery as I am. Warriors are impressed by bravery. I was impressed by the bravery of the Viet Cong when I fought in Vietnam. I couldn't believe that they were doing what they were doing when we had the weapons that we had. And they're running around with a little pouch of rice on their belt and sandals made out of tires with a little pith helmet on their head when they had it. And most of the times they didn't unless they were North Vietnamese regular army. And an AK-47 and a few bullets in a pouch. They impressed the hell out of me. I was impressed. I'm still impressed by what they did. God, I had a $500,000 patrol boat under me. I had three 50 caliber machine guns, a 3.5 inch rocket launcher. I had an 81 millimeter mortar. I had Honeywell grenade launchers, shotguns, M16s. We had so many guns, we never used half of them. And these guys are running on, taking us on at close range on a riverbank with no protection whatsoever. Because they believed in what they were doing. That's why I know we can win the war that's coming. Because you can't beat someone who's not afraid to die and believes in what they're doing. And we're going to be facing troops that are only doing it for a paycheck and the promise of a retirement. Mercenaries. Mercenaries don't fight when they start to experience casualties and the casualties outweigh the value of the paycheck and the promised retirement that will never come if I get lucky.
And I'm a damn good shot, so I know I'm going to be lucky a lot of times before they get me. I don't have any illusions that they won't get me. But I'm going to get enough of them that they're going to wish that I was never born before they do get me. Yes? Do you think Ho Chi Minh, um, I, I've always kind of admired him, but do you think he's part of the plan too? you think he was a game player, or you think he was really someone who was squeezed out? Ho Chi Minh would have been on our side if we had not snubbed our nose at Ho Chi Minh and had not done what we promised him. See, we promised Ho Chi Minh during World War II. He fought with us against the Japanese. We promised him that we would help him liberate his country and that they would be a free country and have their own elections and their own government. We double-crossed him and gave it back to the French. And he said, screw you, I'll get help from wherever I can get it, and I'll be whatever gives me that help. And Russia said, we're, your, we're, we're yours. What do you need? He didn't ask for much, No, he didn't ask for much. He wanted to be free, just like me. Just like me. That's something we never understood. What the hell were we doing there? Had nothing to do with the Constitution or freedom or this country. Nothing at all had to do with big business and world politics between nations and deals we knew nothing about. We were just cannon fodder. That's all. Cannon fodder. And some Vietnam vets get mad at me about that. But you see, I'm a Vietnam vet. I can say whatever the hell I want. I was there. I fought. I earned my right to talk about it. We were lied to, misused, and abused. If you want to pretend that what we did was heroic and wonderful, you go ahead and do that. Me, I don't like lying to myself. It's just not true. Most soldiers who ever fought in the history of the world were used, abused, and were cannon fodder, thinking they were doing the right thing. We all thought we were doing the right thing. We had noble aspirations when we went. Like I told you before, nobody sets out to do wrong. They believe in what they're doing, and they wouldn't be doing it. That's right. We were all young boys, stupid young boys. Me, about as stupid as they get. Yeah. This is what? I need lights off. This is a b -b 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 introduction to the initiating group. Uh, let me see what he says. Oh. This is from the Rand Corporation. They were, it's about a colloquium that they got together to do, the greatest scientists in the country, in cahoots with the United States government. And they put together from May 13th, 1958 to April 25th, 1959, the proceedings of the Lunar and Planetary Exploration Colloquium. It lasted for a year. And it was sort of uh, organized and overseen by the RAND Corporation. Proceedings of Lunar and Planetary Exploration Colloquium, October, this is from October 20-something, 1958, Volume 1, Number 2. I have stacks and stacks of volumes from this. But I just want to show you a few things. Isn't it strange that they tell us that there uh, it's hard to focus this oh this is what I'm looking for it says uh, power for a lunar colony where to land on the moon Observation on Mars and Venus. I didn't even know we had any observations up there on Mars and Venus at that time. But apparently they did. Program of lunar and planetary experiments. And for some reason they considered the crater Line to be extremely important. It could be. And this is just another thing from that Flying Saucer article. And that's it. Have you ever 
One of the strange things I thought I brought, I thought I had it in this slide tray, but I didn't. In, in one of the uh, contents of one of these colloquium proceedings, they talk about the atmosphere on the moon, which is something they've always denied. But that group of scientists didn't deny it. It was listed right in the proceedings that they were studying the atmosphere of the moon. So that's that. What time is it? So we all need a break at this time, I think. Toast. The damn blue. Blue? The blue that view. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to give you a choice. There is no limit to how long we can keep this room. I have two videotapes, one of which we're going to end with. Both are two hours long. Let me tell you what they are. And but before we start, I'm going to let you ask questions if you want for a little while. And then if you want to see the videotape, whichever one we decide by popular vote to see, the ones who want to see it can stay and watch it. Anybody who needs to leave can go ahead and leave. Okay? So, <clears throat> we'll take the vote now. And then we'll have a short question and answer session. For any of you who may have any questions on anything that we've talked about today or yesterday, that I might be able to answer for you. And I can't answer everything. I don't know everything, but I'll try. Okay? We have two videotapes. One is a two-hour tape that I made for researchers. It's not an entertainment tape. At some parts, it sort of drags out because it's to give information to researchers who want information about Area 51. It's called Project Red Light 2. You saw a part of Project Red Light. Not the whole thing, but Project Red Light 2 is the second one that I made about Groom Lake. It has an awful lot of uh, essential footage in it for people who are just interested in researching Groom Dry Lake. has a lot of videotape of the craft in flight, both at night and at the end, one huge craft that you saw at the beginning of Project Red Light 1, hovering over the desert and actually moving off into a cloud. It's a different filming of the same craft at a different time under different circumstances, but it's the only footage like it of its kind. And you'll see the whole area. You'll even see Groom Dry, Dry Lake. Yes, baby. You'll even see Groom Dry Lake filmed from the top of what we call Whitesides Mountain, which the Air Force has now... Yes, baby. Hi. You want to say something? I <laughs> won't. <clears throat> and uh, you can't take those pictures anymore because the Air Force has seized that mountain. You can't get up there and you can't take the picture. The other one is what we call the last will and testament of the Branch Davidians. And everybody on that videotape is now dead except for one black woman who lives in England now. Most people don't know that the Branch Davidians made a videotape <coughs> while they were under siege inside Mount Carmel while they were surrounded by tanks and armored personnel vehicles and uh, the, the, the might of the establishment that was reigned against them. You can see their wounds and listen to them in their own voice, tell why they're there and what they're doing and why they're not going to come out. <coughs> the American public was never supposed to see this videotape. It was made by the Branch Davidians for the FBI. 
to prove that nobody was being held in there against their will like the FBI was telling the world. Remember they said Koresh is holding them all hostage and won't let them come out? Well, that's a lie. And it's about two hours long. And all of the Branch Davidians who are alive at that point, including the children, get in front of the camera and tell their story. So you got your choice. We can do either one of those two, and you can vote on it right now. Okay? How many of you want to see Project Red Light 2? One, two, three, four, five. How many of you want to see the Branch Davidians? Okay, that's the one we'll see, and that's a good choice. That's the one I was hoping that you would make because it's much more important. Okay? Before we start that videotape, if anybody has any questions, this is the time to get it out because when this tape ends, after two hours after it starts, I'm exhausted from doing this for two days. And if you don't think this is exhausting, try standing up and talking for six hours to people two days in a row. So after this tape is over, I don't want to stick around and have questions from people. What I want to do is take my family to dinner and go to bed because I have a long drive tomorrow, okay? So I don't mean it as an insult or, or a slant against anybody and I'm not brushing you off. It, it, what I'm telling you is true. I'm really tired, okay? And I have problems with my legs anyway. So if you have questions, let's get them out now. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability and then we'll go to the tape. Yes, in the back. What kind of solution can you offer to this mess? <laughs> the first solution to our biggest problem. What at first, what is our biggest problem? Lack of knowledge. The vast numbers of American people are ignorant. They don't know what's happening. The number one solution and the biggest goal we have in front of us right now is to educate them, get them information, but not like people normally do it. How are people normally getting information to the American people? They're getting stuff on the fax and over the phone and they're hearing it on the radio and they're just repeating it and passing it on. Is it true? 95% of it we have already proven we know is false. That's got to stop. We have to educate them with the truth. Things that we can document and back up. And if we can't, we have to tell them we can't. Be honest. If it's opinion, say, this is my opinion. Okay, like I do. You've all heard me do these things. If I can prove it, I tell you. If I can't, I tell you. If it's my opinion, I tell you. I don't leave you sitting there guessing. And you shouldn't do that to other people either. And if you get something, if you don't know it's true, don't pass it on. Period. Don't do it. If I can verify things, so can you. I'm no different than you. I'm one lonely, broke, solitary human being with a family that I have to support. I'm no different than anybody. My brain is no bigger. Okay? Whatever I can do, you can do. Somebody tells you you can't do it, laugh at them and point to me. And say, if he can do it, I can do it, because I'm as smart as he is. And it's the truth. You just don't know it half the time. <laughs> People don't tell you that in high school. They tell you, well, you gotta learn your ABCs and at least learn a little bit of reading so you can get a job working for somebody else. They don't tell you, learn all this stuff so you can go out and start a corporation and be all that you can be without joining the Marine Corps <laughs> or the Army or the Navy. They don't tell you that, but that's what they should be telling you if they were worth their salt as educators. Yes, ma'am. The uh, Chinese Navy being down there in Long Beach Naval Shipyard. They're not going to be in Long Beach Naval Shipyard. No? No. The lease was torn up, withdrawn, thrown away. And, and is, is there any other areas besides that that they're doing that? Yeah, both ends of the Panama Canal. They have agreements to put in a big, huge, multi-billion shopping center in Southern California and a whole lot of other things. Clinton is a communist. He's opening this country to communism because that's his job. Yes? Where did the religions uh, concerning Isis and Osiris originate from in what geographic region? Well, if you're talking about Osiris and Isis, that's Egyptian. 
but they didn't originate it. It originated somewhere else under a different name. Babylon, and what was it called there? Nimrod, and Semiramis, and who was the child? Tammuz. And it's the exact same story, exactly the same. They have them all over the world. Same exact story. Different names. Same story. Yes, ma'am. The disappearance of that, that A-10 bomber. Um, the bomber's been found and the body of the pilot has been found. They can't bring it out yet. So they say. Pardon? So they say. Unless I can prove otherwise, they've said that they found it and I have no reason to believe otherwise. Yes. Don't you think now the Chinese, though, can take this canceled deal to the World Trade Organization? The World Trade Organization is going to say, hey, you can't renege on a lease to get China back to court. Well, I wish they would, because that would be proof positive that the United States is not a sovereign nation. And I've been waiting for that proof to flash in front of the American people so that they can't laugh at me when I tell them that. I think that's what they'll do. I think We're not sovereign, folks. But until they do something overtly that can be seen and understood by the American people, I can show them all the treaties and, and charters and documents and, and uh, laws and everything else that say that we're not sovereign anymore, but they're not going to believe it until it absolutely happens. If we're a sovereign nation, the World Trade Organization can't tell us what to do, can they? But they can. And if you studied NAFTA and GATT, you know that they can. Yes. We have not been a sovereign nation for a long, long time. We ceased being a sovereign nation when we signed the United Nations Charter and it became the supreme law of the land. Well, we didn't ratify that until Reagan, right? Pardon? The United Nations Charter? Certainly we did. We didn't ratify that until Reagan. Yes, we did. Before yes, we did. Before yes. The United States created the United Nations, in case you didn't know that. No, you're talking about United Nations resolutions. The United Nations Charter was ratified in the 50s by the United States Senate. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any knowledge of the process which levitates the flying saucers and what fuel they're using to power them? No. All I know is it's something to do with electromagnetic force, whatever that is. It probably has an awful lot to do with an awful lot of patents that Nikola Tesla applied for and obtained many, many years ago. Yes, sir. In the, one of the last chapters, the last chapter of 2001, uh, about Lucifer's star rising. Uh huh. Talk about that. What, I mean, why, why is that put in there? What are they alluding to? Besides <laughs> the very obvious. Well, a Lucifer's star rising. Well, let me, gee, I hate to get into that because it's a whole other lecture altogether. <laughs> In fact, I'd rather not because it'll take up an awful lot of time and we don't have all of that time. Yes? One of my big concerns, while I, took, I understand what you say about militias, uh -huh. uh, I am concerned with affiliating myself self with people <coughs> that either don't have all their brains together or could possibly be infiltrated by government agencies. So how do you how do you organize yourself with people who are wise enough to follow your advice about militias? Well, that's a tough one because people being people, you can't always be sure of anything with people. We've all learned that in our life. People will tell us something for six years and then prove exactly the opposite the next day. You know? And how many of us have been married to people or have been in a personal relationship with someone we thought we knew, and then all of a sudden we find out not the person we thought they were at all. How many times has that happened to all of us? How many times have we been betrayed by a best friend? There is no certainty of that. What you have to do is bring the militia into being and then educate, 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 educate. 
Uniform Code of Military Justice, Constitution, the laws of the state and the nation. Spell it out. Make them understand. And anyone who doesn't understand or demonstrates they want to go contrary to the law and the intent of the Founding Fathers in the formation and the, the organization and operation of the militia, you have to say, you're out of here, bud. And if the rest of the membership goes against you, then you have to get out of there because you can't be a part of something that's not right, that's not lawful, that's not constitutional, with a bunch of people who might do something stupid like these assholes down in Texas who have now taken a hostage and shot somebody. I forgot to tell you, they shot the guy in the shoulder. Stupid! These guys have sealed their fate. They're going down. And ain't nothing in the world can stop it from happening. Because they're wrong. And no one can support them when they're wrong. Yes, ma'am. Do you feel that the flooding in the Midwest that's going on right now and they're evacuating the people, are they in there to take weapons and put people in camps? Or what? No. It's really flooding. It's really flooding in the Midwest. They're really losing their homes. They really need help. No, it's, it's not a scam. It's, it's real. If you don't believe me, call there. And if you can get somebody to answer a phone that's three feet underwater, you find out. It's real. Tied in with that is I hear things about the harp system where they can control the weather and knock your cars out and communication. Yeah, but see, here's the, here's the thing I'm trying to get across to you. You hear these things. When you hear them, why don't you turn to the guy or the girl who tells it to you and say, can you prove what you just told me? It's radio stuff. It doesn't matter. You can call that radio station and talk to that person and say, can you prove what you just said on the radio? Well, uh, blah, blah, blah. then why are you saying it? I've heard it in a couple of forms. One was from a guy that worked on the system. The HARP system. Did you give it any credibility? Give what credibility? The HARP the experiment is there. It's an experiment. Nobody knows what it can do because it's just started. They've only turned it on twice that I know of to conduct atmospheric tests with people who have ham radios to see if they could receive the signals that they were transmitting from the Alaska HARP site. HARP is designed to heat up the ionosphere and create a lens effect. They don't even know what it will do. They have some theories. They have told us what their theories are. If they're telling us the truth, it won't do anything harmful. But they don't know what it will really do, and neither do we. We know that they're fooling around with Mother Nature, and they're changing the nature of a layer in the atmosphere by heating it up to create a lens effect whereby they can transmit radio signals and other things to places where they normally couldn't do it much easier. This is what they tell us. But if you heat up the atmosphere, what are you affecting automatically, whether you want to or not? You're affecting the weather. So we know that whether they intend to or not, whether it's their purpose or not, they're going to have an effect on the weather. That's scientific fact, and you don't have to be a genius to figure it out. If they heat up the atmosphere, it's going to change or affect the weather. Is it going to be a big change, a big effect, or is it going to be minor? We don't know, and neither do they, because the experiment has just started. And all this stuff you're hearing people say is bullshit. They don't know what they're talking about. They're the fear mongers. They're the people who want to sell you some book or something. It's crazy. Somebody asked me, not somebody, counting yesterday and today, about 50 people have asked me about Val Valerian. How many of you have heard of Val Valerian? How many of you have heard of the Matrix? Matrix. Well, somebody is in here because somebody in here asked me about it. I got the answer I was looking for. Okay. Val Valerian, when he wrote The Matrix, was a captain and the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation Counterintelligence Division. 
is a close buddy of John Lear, who is an operative of the Central Intelligence Agency. Together, they wrote The Matrix. Now, what does that tell you? What does it tell you? Disinformation. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what a question that is. And then they wrote a whole bunch of other ones. Val Valerian was transferred from Nellis Air Force Base to Washington State, where he still publishes The Matrix 2, Matrix 3, Matrix 4, and all that kind of stuff. And it's full of crap. The rule is this. Don't hear something and go ask somebody else if it's true. You do the research and find out. If you're too lazy to do the research, quit listening to the crap. Or else, become a Looney Tunes, listen to it, believe it, and do whatever you want, but don't come to my seminars. <laughs> yes, sir? One thing I think was in text bars. And, and folks, when I say this, I don't mean anything personal. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get us into reality. That's all. Yes? And one of Tex Mars' newsletters, I believe it was, he talked about a little look at the plutonium on a satellite that's headed for Jupiter. And some scientists think that the plutonium could ignite the atmosphere and, and create a new sun. I said that years ago. I believe it also. He said that too. So, so, and that's roughly what year 2000 and when it should hit. When they talk about Lucifer's star rising, they're talking about the possible ignition of Jupiter by an experiment called Project Galileo, which is the Galileo spacecraft, which is already there. Its first mission is to photograph all the moons of Jupiter so that they'll have a record before, and then they'll be able to go back and see what happens afterward. Galileo is carrying two opposing banks of plutonium in the spacecraft with a hollow place in between. And it's built structurally sound so that it will not implode until it plunges deep into the atmosphere of Jupiter. When it plunges deep enough into that atmosphere, the tremendous pressures of that atmosphere will collapse that spacecraft with an implosion. The same thing that triggers the atomic bomb. Do you know how an atomic bomb is made? Two opposing banks of plutonium with an explosive around it. Hi, baby ignited to implode with, with equal pressure from all points. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. So that's the same thing that's going to happen with the Galileo spacecraft. And NASA will admit to you. They've admitted it to me and many other people who've asked them. What's going to happen to it? Well, after it photographs the final moon, which is Io, closest to Jupiter's circus, our surface, it will go into Grading orbit. a decaying orbit around Jupiter. And around December of 1999 was the date they gave me, it will plunge into Jupiter. When it reaches the depth where the pressure is great enough, it will implode, driving these two banks of plutonium together. And it will create an atomic explosion. So you your computer turned off that day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But here's the danger. See, an atomic explosion on Jupiter is not enough to ignite Jupiter into a sun. But if that spacecraft is deep enough within the atmosphere to cause that implosion, and the atomic explosion takes place at a depth in the atmosphere where the pressure is strong enough to hold that explosion, it will turn from a fission reaction into a fusion reaction, and Jupiter will become a sun. I have talked to scientists who say, yes, it can happen. I have talked to scientists who say, it's ridiculous, it could never happen. I have talked to scientists who scratch their head and say, I don't really know. I have talked to Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote the book about this really happening. And he said that when he wrote the book, NASA was extremely interested. Allison, stop. Come here, right now. Thank you, baby. I love you so much. Go with little Pooh. Go with Pooh. You got her? 
boy. Hey, you. Go with Pooh. Okay. Bye bye. See you later. Arthur C. Clarke said when he wrote the book, he was grilled by NASA. Now, how do we know NASA's in all of this stuff? Look at the dates of the NASA programs, the landings on the moon, manned and unmanned. Compare them to the symbolism of the mysteries. And then take a look at old Kleindienst. You know who Kleindienst is? He was the man who was the head of NASA during the Apollo space program. Who is Kleindienst today? He's the Supreme Inspector General of the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. How's that for a kick in the butt? <clears throat> Does that mean he's top dog in there? Or? Yeah. He's the big cheese. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, concerning the people who, who are uh, dealing with the obelisks and the reflecting pools, are these people behind this actually enslaved to this religion, or are they, or are they just using the symbology as a way to communicate? They're not enslaved to it. They believe in it. They believe that they're, what they're doing is the best thing for all of humanity. It's their religion. And what is that religion? All of these things, the symbols, are just a way of expressing a metaphor. And the metaphor is this, that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. He was set free by Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect the use of which mankind will conquer nature and the universe and man will become God. So it is secular humanism. It is the religion of Marxist socialism and communism and has always been that religion and nothing else. The enemies of freedom hide behind many different veils and occupations and names and organizations, but when you come right down to the very bottom of it, they are always socialist, communist, secular, humanist. That is their religion. Always. The obelisk is the symbol of the generative force, the intellect, thought, desire, action. Remember what I taught you? Okay, any other questions? So, yes. Okay, when we had the Apollo 13 disaster and the Challenger disaster, how, many, how widespread was the knowledge of being that the you know, something was going? <clears throat> I don't know to tell you the truth, but it would have been in the upper ep echelon. The, the very number of the mission would have told the initiates what was happening. It was the death of the space program, wasn't it? Never went to the moon again, or anywhere else for that matter. And a new NASA was born out of that event. And they went to the shuttle program. The death, the rebirth, the resurrection as something different. A question on the obelisks. Um, do do they all work in concert, people in South America, talk with people in South yes. America, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. In all the great cities of the, in big cities of the world, they're yes. globalists. So do they all mean exactly the same exactly thing? Exactly the same thing. We had the opportunity to see them in a lot of countries, but never knew what it meant. Let me tell you how widespread this is. <clears throat> how many of you know about the Gorbachev Foundation? Hmm. What is the flag of the Gorbachev Foundation? a green cross on a white field. What was the flag that Columbus planted on the sand on the first time he set foot in the Americas? A green cross on a white field. How about that? Why did he do that? Wasn't he sailing in the name of the Queen of Spain? Didn't she finance his exposition? Wasn't he supposed to claim those lands for Spain? 
Wasn't the first flag planted supposed to be the flag of the royal house of Spain? But it wasn't. It was the flag of the society which he truly represented using the Queen of Spain's money. How many of you have been to Las Vegas? How many of you have seen the MGM Grand from the air? What is it? A huge green cross. At the entrance, there is a huge lion's head. And what is the lion head staring at? The Luxor. Staring directly at the Luxor Hotel. What are they building out there? I mean, what is it? It's supposed to be. It's supposed to turn out to be. Command <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, what are your views on uh, Borda, Borda uh, killing himself? Admiral Borda was murdered. I've got lots of information. We published the whole story in our newspaper. It might be over there. He shot himself in the heart twice. That's tough anyway, isn't it? Oh, it's really tough. And a military man would never shoot himself in the chest with anything, and especially a 38. Admiral Burda, if he was going to shoot himself, would have shot himself in the head with a 45. And he wouldn't have gone out on the lawn to do it. And he left supposedly two letters, which they won't let us see because they weren't signed. <laughs> You'll leave a letter for your wife. Are you not going to sign it? Huh? You leave a letter for anybody. Are you not going to sign it? You're going to type it up and leave it laying around? And then go outside, shoot yourself in the chest twice with a 38 caliber pistol? A career, lifetime military man? Not on your life. Admiral Burda was murdered. I don't know why he was murdered, but he was murdered. First, he was set up to be discredited, and then he was murdered. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, so Me too. I'm thoroughly confused. Do the, do the people behind this man, do, did they truly believe that there was a man no, these are metaphors. You're getting the symbology mixed up with the message. These are, you know what a metaphor is? There's your problem. Where's a dictionary? Your homework is to look up the word metaphor. Okay? But are all these obelisks just truly only symbols of the stages of mankind and they're not, they don't? No, the obelisk is the symbol of the generative force, the phallus. Okay, you know what a phallus is? When you go home tonight, take off your clothes, look in the mirror. <laughs> We're dealing with a young man over here. I'm not making fun of you. I know you have questions. I think he's doing great. I think he's doing wonderful. And, and I commend him for being here because the future belongs to him. But these are some things that you're going to have to look up. Your problem is not with what you're hearing, your problem is that you don't know the meaning of some of the words that we're talking about. If you knew the meanings of those words, you wouldn't be having a problem. But we're beyond the point where I can spend any more time on that, otherwise I certainly would. But uh, if you'll write me a personal letter, I'll make sure you get enough material to keep you busy for a long time, okay? So if you'll do that, I'll take care of you. Yes, sir. I did yesterday, spent over an hour on it. <laughs> All I can tell you is I'm on satellite GE1, Transponder 7, 7.56 audio right now, where we have a worldwide freedom radio network. We are putting together a network of low power FM stations across the country, which are rebroadcasting our programming and other programming, and even programming of their own. And uh, we're on uh, WRMI. Worldwide shortwave radio out of Miami, Florida. That's 9955 kilohertz. 
We're on Monday through Friday, 5 until 7 p.m. daylight standard time. We'll go to only one of those hours. I don't know which one yet on May the 7th. From what time to what time? 5 to 7 daylight Eastern. Yes? Terry Reed, any idea on what's happening with I don't even know who Terry Reed is. I haven't even read it. <laughs> never heard of him. I can't believe it. Well, maybe I'll there are people I've never heard of, just like there are people you've never heard of. I'm just like you guys. I don't know everybody. I know some people. But I'll tell you this. If I don't know the person, they're not way high up in patriot, real patriot community, I can tell you that. Because I know all of the high up people in the real <laughs> patriot community many of whom none of you will ever know. Okay? But that doesn't mean he's not a good person or he shouldn't read his book. I don't know who he is, never read the book. Any other questions? Then we're going to start the video. One more, yes. What kind of support are you willing to accept or what kind of support, how can you be supported from our community? What kind of support are you talking about? No, it's not. If, if anybody wants to make a donation, they can make it out to the Independence Foundation Trust, which is the only trust that we have that can accept any kind of a charitable donation. And then can, it, the purpose of the trust is to save the country. Every penny that goes into that trust goes toward doing that, educating the American people. Okay. If you want to contribute to the phone uplink fund to the satellite uplink for the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, you can make those donations out to Harvest Trust. Those are different kinds of donations from the listenership of the, of the network. If you want to contribute information, just send it. Don't ever call me and ask me if I want something. The answer is always yes. And I don't even care what it is. If it's information, I want it. If it's a book, I want it. If it's a newspaper article, I want it. If it's something that came off the Patriot Facts Network, I don't ever want it. <laughs> Never. Okay? Yes, sir? Is this entire program going to be on uh, audio or video? It's on video. You can order it right back there. It's $45 a day. It's two tapes, six hours each day. Uh, and I think there's $5 postage and handling. If you want both days, it's $100, including postage and handling. I didn't set it up. I didn't do it. I'm just telling you what it is because you want it. <laughs> See Doyle. He's the guy handling all that stuff. I came here by invitation. Yeah, we're having a conference in the state of Arizona from June 30th through July 4th, and including that night. And uh, that's intense. That's five solid days from the time you get up in the morning until midnight. You're, you belong to me. That's Kaji and the intelligence service, yeah. What do you require of people that become Kaji members? I know how the process to get in, but once you're in, are you We put you to work, we require you to work. It's not like other things where you join and you pay your dues and, and uh, you get some benefits and you don't have to do anything. If you join our organization, you must work. If you don't, we'll kick you out. Simple as that. We're, our, our focus is something different. We want to save this country. We don't want to mess around. If you don't want to be a part of us, we don't want to mess with you. We don't, at the same time, mean that you're a bad person or anything else. We just don't have time for it. We want people who are committed, want to work, want to produce, want to do something. Who had a question back there? Yes, sir. Are the Native Americans being involved? Yes, I'm one. You're looking at one. 
Not all the tribes, no. You'll find on every reservation, amongst the Native American communities, there are two types of Native Americans. One is the traditionalist that loves freedom just like me and has been fighting forever to gain it back and keep it. Okay? Those of you who have read about some of those battles, you know. The other is the hang around the Ford Indians. The hang around the Ford Indians have been bought and paid for. They're socialists. They want their blanket from the government every week. They want their little paycheck so that they can go to Indian heaven, which is Walmart. <laughs> and uh, they want the government to take care of them. And they'll do anything to please the government, including ratting on the traditionalists and even killing the traditionalists or anything else they have to do. <laughs> and yes, the traditionalists are with us, whoever we may be. The hang around the Fort Indians, <laughs> no, no, they're socialists.